We had a really interesting roundtable on big opportunities for new partners in the reInvent Nuclear Security Series. Who knew there were so many great ideas about how you could expand the notion of partnering with the nuclear security establishment of big governments and kind of insiders. One of the most interesting areas for a new generation of partnerships is in the nascent nuclear energy industry. When I say nascent, there's a next generation. I think as of right now, there are about two dozen new um, private companies that are all developing new types of nuclear reactor designs. What's so fascinating to me about it is that these are all, all different varieties of reactors, all different base technologies. Um, many of them have significant nuclear security benefits, some have drawbacks. Many of them, even more interestingly, are in the very early days of their development. So there's this potential for these new designs as they're being made to be able to bake in, integrate in um, nuclear security features. Transatomics reactor is able to consume the uranium and plutonium and other actinides that are in existing stockpiles of used nuclear fuel. So we're able to remove the risk from the existing used nuclear fuel. Other features that are very attractive are designs that can be sealed for long amounts of time. A number, at least four or five of the um, 20 or 30 new nuclear companies out there are focusing specifically on figuring out how to use down-blended weapons uranium or plutonium to power their reactor designs. There was also many potential partners in the nuclear security world that could come from tech companies working now on technologies that might not be obviously applicable to nuclear security, but in the end might prove to be very, very helpful. In the area of satellite imagery, this is, I think, a, a really exciting area when we look at that issue of quicker detection. We're seeing um, sort of a shift in the model of the way commercial satellites have traditionally been deployed, um, where we're seeing more companies that are developing constellations of smaller cheaper satellites um, that are creating this novel capability of being able to monitor large areas of the, of the planet on a more frequent basis. And that's something that has never existed in the public domain and international organizations tasked with nonproliferation are actively looking at that capability to see how it could potentially be incorporated into these systems the area of mobile sensors. There's a vast amount of information um, and resources um, that could be tapped in that area as well um, that, again, international organizations um, could, could potentially use for verification. Uh, it, it's interesting to me that, uh, you know, as we go and, and travel across the developing world, governments in these countries uh, at, one, at one time wanted to engage with the United States. Today, they don't want to hear from <laughs> They want to hear from Google. They want to hear from uh, from Intel. They want to engage with General Motors. So the question for us is how do we begin to develop an agenda that gets our companies to actually begin to carry water for us? Potential partners are not all just high-tech firms working on cutting-edge technologies. There's all kinds of businesses and organizations in many mundane fields that would have a role to play in stopping nuclear proliferation. There are many, many actors that, that have a role potentially in disrupting acquisition of, of, of a nuclear weapon. So uh, to your point, it's those insurers that underwrite shipments, that it's the financial industry that, uh, that may be financing activities, either in developing technologies or ultimately moving those technologies. Perfectly legitimate companies whose, whose activities and services may be used for nefarious ends. It's port operators, it's shipping companies, it's air freight, uh, uh, companies. Whether you're moving fissile materials or you're moving underage girls, they're traveling on the same carriers through the same ports. And so those people who are thinking about global supply chains really have an important role to play in solving not just this problem, but multiple interconnected problems. And then potential partners don't even have to be companies or organizations at all. There was a lot of talk about how do we tap into the brain power and talent pool of all kinds of remarkable people acting independently all over the planet. 
So when it comes to these types of big systemic issues, we identify individuals that we think can make an impact on them and we provide them with the platform and resources and even sometimes the training to deliver their message. And so the storytelling is sort of the biggest part of what we do and it takes months and months in order to do that. And I think that that's something that is not always so obvious to people that how much time it takes to deliver a 20 minute talk that um, people will, will understand. So one of the very first public talks that Transatomic gave was at TEDx New England back in November 2011. And I was very uncertain about it. It was just a few months after Fukushima. I wasn't quite sure how they would feel about nuclear power, but the TEDx organizers were so good at working with us, with me at figuring out a way to put out this message about nuclear in a way that would address people's concerns. And it ended up being a presentation that I think connected very well to the audience. Now to expand this notion of partners and to get many, many more people and organizations and companies involved in this world of nuclear security, there's gonna have to be a lot of obstacles overcome. And a big portion of the conversation was about what's standing in the way of making these kind of partnerships work? Well, there may be good intentions on the side of government and good intentions uh, on the side of industry um, until we can bridge over the, the challenge of pace at which those two sectors uh, operate, until we can better align these time frames uh, or figure out a way to do it, uh, building an effective partnership is, is extremely, extremely challenging. But uh, nuclear experts, um, they tend to know where to look in terms of figuring out what government needs are, in terms of figuring out what international organization needs are, um, but they tend to be pretty buried <laughs> um, in the sense that you have to know which website to go to and where to dig within that website to find out what kind of needs and what kind of partnerships and what kinds of technologies are being sought. You know, and innovators can be immediately turned off um, from getting more involved in this field. Right now, there's no clear, rapid regulatory pathway for prototyping or commercializing the advanced reactor designs in the US. And this has led to a lot of the reactor startups, um, including Bill Gates' TerraPower, deciding to go overseas. One structural change that would be very logical to make would be to make a clearer regulatory pathway for these advanced reactor designs in the U.S. so that the companies will be incentivized to stay here, retain their investment here, keep their technology here. We have a lot of good ideas for ways to move this field forward, but ultimately we have to get the buy-in of other countries as well um, in order to implement it. Anyone who studies verification um, and technologies for non-proliferation knows that there's this sort of dancing line between what is seen as verification and what is seen as spying. For example, international organizations are very careful never to say that they are monitoring, um, rather that they are their technologies are evaluating capabilities. So when you look at a site with satellite imagery, you are evaluating capabilities. You are not monitoring it. And, you know, and it's things like that that could, I think, make a lot of progress if bring in new partners that have that awareness. As always, this roundtable tried to focus also on very practical, very concrete ideas of what could be done by N Square, our partners in this, as well as the foundation's backing N Square. What could be done to actually move the ball, get over those obstacles, and broaden this notion of partners and get them actively involved? Brian, do you think that um, there is anywhere a good top view? Now, is there any place as a as a potentially as a new partner in this field, is there a place that I would be able to go to really understand the domain in all of its uh, complexity and understand where maybe the opportunities are and where the barriers are? That is a great question. And, and of course, I mean, I've been looking for about 15 years for that, uh, Eric, and I have not found it. It's elusive, and I think it's elusive because the industry, if you will, is now just so diversified. One of the the gaps in our field is that there is that there isn't really a, a clear front door um, or a clear meeting place to um, for participants to facilitate that exchange, an environment that is accessible to the non-expert community. I mean, I'm biased. I'm coming from TED, but I keep thinking about who are the individuals 
who have a message that's really compelling that people want to listen to. I think there's a lot of behind the scenes work that needs to happen, um, but I think that there's a public element um, and, and a little, you know, starting a movement around it is really important. And so in the end, this round table was a perfect segue to the others coming in the series, particularly the next one on how do we get the next generation of innovators, the young millennial generation, how do we get many more of them involved in this cause and ultimately working on this issue. Thank you.